good morning. Uh, what a great last week we had. The whole week was so good. And um, hope you get to see some pictures Sunday uh, evening. Sunday evening we showed some videos of the Vacation Bible School. We'll probably show it again next Sunday morning. But um, just a great thing seeing uh, at least four of our bus routes up and running again. And um, God's been awfully good to us. And I sure appreciate your faithfulness. Could I just could I just say to you that our members here at our church, thank you for your faithfulness. And I appreciate you so much. Um, I wanted to read you a story, uh, just a, a couple of lines from this book I've used before, Imprisoned Preachers and Religious Liberty in Virginia. You know, back in the 1700s, 1800s, they had no problem with very long titles of books today. You know, their titles of books are very brief, one word, two or three word. But uh, some of my old books, I, I think, how in the world do you get away with, how do you catalog a, the title of a book that's like two sentences? But anyway, uh, the styles change and uh, time change. Excuse my, I have some water here. My voice is not recovered, and, and uh, but I'm thankful that God's let me be a part of the ministry. It's a great thing to be able to serve God. And I want to mention, uh, I'll read this story first about these preachers. Now, this is a story, a springboard to a principle. Uh, I mentioned before John Waller, James Child, and Lewis Craig were arrested in uh, 1768. They were offered liberty, and they were just basically arrested for preaching. They weren't licensed by the Anglican or Congregational Church. Protestants were willing to buckle under the uh, the Church of England and the Protestant oversight and get licenses, do what they're told. You know, a lot of those Protestants, if you haven't heard me talk about all these Protestants, they were they were told they could not read the Bible in public. They could read from the common book of prayers. They could read um, things that someone else wrote about the Bible. But to just sit and open a Bible and preach it, that was against the law. One of the things that put... Um, John Bunyan in jail, where he wrote the great Pilgrim's Progress. The judge, um, the judge said, "Do you think just any fool with the Bible should be able to stand up and preach?" And and, and George, uh, John, uh, John Bunyan said, "Well, yeah. As a matter of fact, I, I do. Uh, that's our right." And uh, freedom was a costly thing. And uh, I promise you this: freedom is always going to be under attack. Because the devil is, uh, is uh, the, the designer of bondage, whether it be drugs and alcohol that bring bondage, whether it be moral um, uh, wrongdoing that brings bondage, it could bring, be uh, any number of, of things from wealth where a, a love of money uh, brings people into bondage or love of power. The devil, he'll find a way to get people bound. Uh, I, I love I love nature to see the wonders of God. How do you not sit in awe at God when you look at what he's done and yet you you turn that admiration from the God who made it to the creature. You Romans 1, you worship and serve the creature more than the creator. And the devil just turns that corner and suddenly you've got people who are passionate and rabid environmentalists who they think you need to kill all the people so the except them of course so the world can be protected and they don't have enough brains to see the difference between a, a wild apple tree and an apple orchard that's been well pruned and cared for by man, men and God put even in the perfect garden of Eden God put a man in that garden to till the ground to keep it to keep that garden nothing grows as well on its own in nature as it does when it's cared for. And, uh, and anybody, you know, these people who are the rabid environmentalists probably never grew up apricot or a peach, don't have a clue about what really makes things work. But the point is, the devil can get people's uh, love for things to be their bondage and bring them subservient to it where you refuse to hear facts. And... Um, whether it be what you believe about COVID or what you believe about wind power, what you believe about socialism. And if you're not willing to listen to facts, then you're enslaved. And it's willful. You are, you've submitted yourself and, and, and 
And so these Baptists back uh, throughout history, they've been very difficult. And um, these three Baptists were brought to trial and, and uh, um, in the, uh, the familiar story, Patrick Henry rode miles and miles and miles to jump in and represent them. And he said, did I hear that these men are being tried for preaching the gospel of the Son of God? And he, it's a pretty dramatic story, but it's a great story. But here's the statement I wanted to bring out. The, the witnessing, one of them was accused. They said, you can't pass these men on the street without them cramming a scripture verse down your throat. They were witnessing. They were talking on the streets about Christ. They were soul winners. And, um, and one little twisted statement, cramming a scripture down your throat. And, and pretty soon, a little bit of truth is twisted and twisted and twisted. And, and suddenly you've got these horrible villains. And um, here it is, the statement I love. And again, this is out of 1768, before social media. Now, all these instances, which we have quoted, um, so widely separated as to time and place, are but illustrations of how an ill-founded rumor can gain publicity and cling to life with wonderful tenacity. How an ill-fated rumor can gain publicity and cling to life with wonderful, not wonderful meaning good wonderful, but it's a wonder, how could this happen? Wonderful tenacity. Now, when you consider this, you realize that in every culture, whether it be Hitler's Germany or, or modern day America, a little twist of the facts, you know, that, um, whether it be... Um, the rich, the 1% that don't pay their fair share of taxes or whatever it might be. But people, people, um, a little twisting of something here or there. And suddenly we've got a group of young, um, under 30 age people who want the government to take control of big business or take control of this. And it never occurs to them because they never had any decent history taught to them that you don't want the government controlling people. Yes, when, see, if, if Coca-Cola and Pepsi and whatever other soda producing company, um, if they are, if one of them gets corrupt, I can go drink the other guy's soda. But when the government gets corrupt, I can't go anywhere. And the last thing we want is more government control. And yes, mankind is corrupt. You're, you're, you can have government corrupt and they'll oversee and overrule everything. Or you can have businesses corrupt, and men can rebel against them. And we've got to understand Satan's goal is control, control, control. And it may be, um, it may be the, the like I said, the drugs or liquor, or it may be a controlling husband who somehow feels it's his job to dominate over his wife and children. You know, by the time my children were ten or twelve years old, I didn't tell them what to do. They were old enough to make some decisions. And um, certainly in my married life, I can think of one time I almost sort of insisted on something. And it was other than wanting ketchup on my sandwiches that my wife couldn't hardly imagine that. I will go to Subway and, uh, and I'll ask for a ketchup. And uh, the one uh, locally here, they started going to McDonald's and they'd had ketchup packets from me. So I'm at Subway getting McDonald's ketchup packets. But um, my, our youngest was born, and my wife loves teaching, and she'd been teaching in our school. And she said, what do you think about me teaching again? And, and I, I didn't insist, but I said, I'd really prefer you stay home until he got school. We didn't need the money. Um, obviously, you always could use some money. But my children needed their mother more than my children needed more money in the house. And, um, and uh, no one more valuable to that preschool child than my wife. And, um, and I didn't insist, but I did definitely give her my opinion. Um, but, but there are men who, who uh, want to dominate and control. And I think, man, that's demonic. No human being should be under the control of another human being. And uh, in our church, I have regularly said, hey, first Wednesday of the month, you can vote me out. Um, you don't like me, vote me out. And, and I'll, 
I'll go get a little cabin in the mountains and go fishing each day. Um, the idea of, of, a, of a religion controlling or of a, of a, of a, uh, a even a, a boss controlling his people. You ought to be able to go get a different job. And, and I tell our people often, your boss doesn't own you. You get hired for an agreed amount of hours. And you need to go home and be a husband or a wife. You need to be a, a family person. You need to have a life. What's the point of having that job if you don't have a life? And you ought to be able to take a vacation. You ought to be able to go goof off. And, and I tell people, and you that are in our church know it, I tell people, go vacation. You have your children this little window of time. Go enjoy life. You, know, you wait till you're sick and crippled up to to go travel. You, you know, and your only traveling is going to be to the doctor's office and back. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm for take a week off here, take two weeks off here. We've been here 39 years and one time my wife and I took two and a half weeks off. We'd never taken more than, um, we'd taken a, a two-week vacation, sort of, that was Monday to Friday. So we missed one Sunday and two Wednesdays. We'd done that a couple of times. But we took, a, a couple of years ago, we took a two and a half. We, went, we, we missed two Sundays and three Wednesdays. And uh, I, I don't want to be gone from, I love what I do. I love where, my friends here at our church. But I thought it was good for my wife and I. And uh, while we're well, and I hope you'll goof off some, and whatever fun is for you, and um, take some time to be quiet and, and enjoy your children, your grandchildren, whatever. And um, we don't have a lot planned this summer. We have one uh, Monday through Friday vacation, but we're going with our two of our married kids and their kids and my sister, and and um, and uh, I like vacation. But but the point is, the devil is always in a control mode. And um, you'll see it in our laws, and you, you see it in the book of, of Daniel. They wanted to control Daniel's prayer life. They wanted to control Daniel's friends. You have to bow down here. And, and the devil's always, and, and by the way, most of the time, he, the devil uses courts. And uh, remember how many times the lawyers were the problem to Jesus? And, oh, man, they were looking for this and looking for that, and and in fact, today we're in Luke chapter 7, if you want to turn there. But the religious people, they hated Jesus because he preached at them. And, and uh, he, he, he said, your religion is, you've made your religion a mockery. And, and uh, he was hard on them. And, um, but, but the government was the ones that crucified Jesus. Remember, the Jews arrested him, the priests and the religious leaders, but they had to take him to Herod and to, to Pilate uh, because the, the, you needed the government's authority. And so they used the court system there. And, and the Apostle Paul several times was brought before courts. And, and, um, and this, this whole evil governments, <clears throat> governments are so, so controlling. And when, when someone's trying to force you or compel you and, um, manipulate things and and, uh, and just just understand that is that we should be on guard when we start seeing that kind of thing because um, there's something wonderful about love and love and freedom go hand in hand you know there's two or three churches within a mile or two here it is none of my business what they do it's their church and uh, now they start you know, influencing our church. I may say, here's a doctrine or whatever we don't believe or whatever it might be, but it doesn't matter to me what goes on in another church. That's their church. And liberty has been the American way. And when people want to control and to dominate or even destroy, if you don't submit, and that's an evil thing, but I want to show you the double standard. And we've seen it, of course, in, in the media and politics. <clears throat> but look at Look at uh, this passage here in um, Luke chapter 7 and down at verse um, 33, John, Luke seven thirty three. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he hath a devil. So John the Baptist came in and he was an abstinence man. He was you know, locusts and wild honey and and he was this totally separate from society. And they said, he, he's got a devil. He's demon-possessed. And then on the other side, verse 34, 
the Son of Man has come. That's Jesus speaking of himself. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking. And you say, behold, a gluttonous man, a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. I had the worst time finding that verse. I knew the verse, but I couldn't find the reference. And so I looked at the word wine bibber. Couldn't find it anywhere in the Bible. I knew it was right. Well, it's one word. And I was typing a search for two words. But uh, verse 34, the Son of Man came eating and drinking. You say, a gluttonous man, a wine bibber, a friend of publicans and sinners. But verse 36, or verse 35, but wisdom is justified of all her children. Here's John, a life of separation and abstinence. They said he's demonic. Here's Jesus eating with sinners. They accused him because he was a friend of sinners and he'd eat dinner with the publicans and, and he was a horrible man. And you know, when people are evil, you can't please them. This crowd of, of Christ-hating, Bible-hating, Bible-believing Christian haters, if you're really separated, they're going to find a reason to hate you. If you are relaxed and you hang out with everybody, you're going to be really hated. And, and you can't. You can't win. And that's why um, there in that one story, it talked about how this, um, um, I'm blanking on the, the phrase, but I caught that when I was reading, um, an ill-founded rumor can gain publicity and cling to life with tenacity. Um, you could, you'll, you'll get this person criticized. You'll get that person slandered. You know what a critic and a slanderer, it is a heart issue and they are going to be ugly. And they know I've heard people say haters are going to hate. And I, I don't really like that phrase. It may be that you use it if you want. I'm not going to use it, but um, uh, hate's a pretty strong word, and it might be true. It could be totally true, but I'm I'm just I believe I really look for the best in people, and um, and I I, I want to love people and and I want to care about people and and again I want to give great liberty. I uh, as a, as a child of God, we need so to be so careful that that not just that we're so loving we love evil, but that we're loving enough to to let people follow their conscience. You know, the, the whole American idea of freedom of conscience, um, freedom of religion is not just about church. It's a, it's, it's goes together with the freedom of conscience to believe what I want to believe. As long as my freedom doesn't take away your freedom, my freedom should be protected. Now, I'm not free to go shooting my gun in a building full of people because that's taking away your freedom for safety. But... But I should be free to drive as long as the way I drive doesn't take away your safety. And, and this, this whole thing of you can't please people. And, and here the perfect son of God and John the Baptist, who Jesus said there's not a, a, not a better man born of woman than John the Baptist. So we've got a perfect son of God. And then we've got the man Jesus said was the best man ever born to a woman. I'd say those two are pretty incredible. And this group of critics and slanderers in the middle uh, attack him for his separation, attack him for his relaxed spirit, and, and, and they end up killing both of them. Take off John the Baptist's head and crucify Jesus. But I'll tell you what, here we are 2,000 years later, and who wins? John the Baptist and Jesus certainly won this one. And uh, don't ever fret, God's in charge. But when we start considering what God's doing in the world, I think about Israel and how Israel's been hated. Uh, the Balfour Declaration right after World War One, and, and uh, Israel was given, you know, supposed to have been given some property, and immediately there was arguing over. You know, they talked about giving the Jews a piece of South America. You know, now we think it's absurd, but we're a hundred years later. But they talked about places around. Well, the Jews need a place. Let's find a piece of land and put them there. No, they have a place given by God, clear back in Genesis, but, um, but it's, a, it's holy. In fact, the first time the word holy is used in the whole Bible, it's not about a religious artifact. It's not about a person. It's about dirt. And Moses is up on, on the mountain watching his sheep and the, and the uh, bush is on fire. And he said, and God spoke through the bush and said, take your shoes off. You're on holy ground. And that law of first mention you find the first time the word is used in the Bible, typically it, it identifies it, it defines it, and it sets the, the ambiance, you might say, for that word. And the holy thing in Israel is the land. 
And that's why they call it the Holy Land. It's a biblical term. And uh, But um, you go up to the end of World War II and, and Israel... Israel helped, uh, it, the Israeli people helped, uh, the Allied forces helped the British in World War I, World War II, and of course, in, especially in World War I, World War II, they were hated by the Jews, by the Germans, and murdered and destroyed, and millions killed, and, and all the violence, all the hatred, and yet, 1948, they're given their freedom. They got this piece of land that no one even wanted. It was a swamp land, disease infested. It was a barren land, and, and yet, some Jewish people began using their resourcefulness and the blessing of God, whether they knew it or not, to make that place prosperous. They get freedom, 1948. And days later, five to seven, whatever it was, Muslim nations surround that little group of people, and they are blown away. And, and we'll talk maybe a little bit about this in church, but, but uh, the, uh, uh, the nation of Israel put itself on the map in a big way, and, and they were... They were about to take major control, and then the whole world jumps on them and says, all right, right, let's have a peace treaty here. Let's have a truce. And uh, now why not leave them alone? Why not let them fight this thing out? Had the Muslims destroyed the Jews, no one would have stopped them. And then you get up, and I don't know all the history. I'm not a historian. I love to read, and I wish I had more time to read. But you get up to the 60s, you know, the Seven-Day War, Six-Day War, and uh, again, the, the Muslim nations surround Israel. They're going to push them off into the Mediterranean. They're going to destroy them and take over. And and uh, some people from the outside, some Americans, some Germans, some people that really got their heart tied with Israel, the Israeli people, they all they go join together. And, and man, the stories are amazing. And that in six days, they literally demolished the Muslim world. They had total control of the Temple Mount. They pushed the Muslims completely out of there. And all of a sudden, the whole world saying, peace, peace, peace. Give everybody a break. And um, I'm going somewhere if you wonder how I got over to Israel. And uh, so, and uh, and the Jews trying to be peaceful. And uh, and they they back off. And now the that, that dome, the Jews could have blown that mosque up if they wanted to. They had total dominance. They had total control. And they could have blown that thing to pieces. But they're trying to appease this world. And could I tell you, you can't appease godless governments any more than you can appease godless people. If the Jews withdraw and just live scattered around the world, they're hated and they're sought after to be destroyed. If the Jews gather together on that piece of real estate um, east of the Mediterranean Sea, they're hated and assaulted and their land is dissected, give this to this person, give this to this country, and, and you can't please godless governments, and you can't please godless people. And you know what? There's, there's a God in heaven. That's who we need to please. There's a book that guides us, a God who we're to try and please by honoring his book, and you wait and see. When we lost, I mentioned this in church, but for you that weren't there, when, when President Trump was... was uh, not re-elected. And I have no doubt in my mind that was of God. I have no doubt in my mind it was crooked and corrupt. But President Trump, you know, clear back before, before um, Slick Willie's the only name I can think of, um, um, the, our, our Congress voted to move our embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And, uh, and uh, Clinton... Um, ignored it. Bush ignored it for all of the Bush's conservatism. They're globalists, trilateralists, depending what era, what terminology you want to use. They were into a one world government and they might have been on the conservative side, but they weren't like that. That Republican Party is not what most of you believe, or certainly not what I believe. And uh, President Trump stepped up and said, No, we're going to do it. And we're moving in. Oh, man, that was, that was like a death sentence. He signed his own death warrant and um, moved that embassy into Jerusalem. And, and uh, now we've got an anti-Israel president and administration. And I'm excited. This God knows what's going on. Um, before Jesus comes again. Now, the trumpet and the rapture could take place any moment. And we're talking about that in church on Sunday mornings. But the end of days when the Lord comes back to the earth and there's an earthly kingdom set up, 
there is going to be a time when the nations, plural, all go against Israel. And Israel is going to be outnumbered beyond words. And Jesus is going to come back. I talked about it Sunday morning. If you weren't there, it should be online. You can probably find it. Jesus is going to come back and surprise everybody, blow them all away. And blood will run to the bridle of a horse and on and on. Now, but but President Trump, he was too, he was too much for freedom. He was too much for Jesus in the Bible, and he was too much for Israel. And the world could not tolerate that kind of man being the president of the United States. The whole world organization, this world system, could not tolerate someone who stood for freedom and stood for the Bible and stood for Israel and for the home. You see, the things the devil hates, if you want to list it on the devil's hate list, of course, it's God in the Bible, but the earthly things, Israel, the family, and the Bible preaching church. Israel, the family, and the Bible preaching church. And we suddenly had us a president in the White House who he was acting like a Christian. I don't know if he's a Christian or not. It's none of my business to judge him, but I'll tell you what, he was pro-church and he was pro-Bible. And uh, it was pretty exciting days. And, and well, you know what? The whole world, uh, he started influence England. And you notice we had a, a pretty conservative guy stepping up to leadership. And, and there was a rallying of, of people of values, people of morals, people of convictions. And I'll tell you something, the, the world's crowd and the devil's crowd hates conviction. They hate morality. Yeah, you, could, you could believe horses and people ought to get married and you're going to be accepted. You could believe any moral depravity you want. And, uh, but you start standing up for Israel, the Bible, the church, and the home, and, and the traditional values of mother and father and children and church. And while well, you, you will be in the devil's crosshairs. And uh, I'm excited about what's happening. Now, don't be surprised, like we read here in Luke chapter 7. If you're this side, you're going to be criticized. If you're that side, you're going to be criticized. You could not make the devil's crowd happy if your life depended on it. There's no amount of giving. And Israel tried to give, and they were hated. Israel tried to give this way, and they were hated. And the mistake, I don't know mistake, I'm not a politician, but to me, um, you, if Israel gave all their land to the Muslims and then blew themselves up, they would still be hated. Because darkness hates light. And, and I know today, the Jews aren't light. I know they crucified our Savior. And they are, uh, during the tribulation, they're called, in Jerusalem, is called Sodom. And uh, it's not a place in God's favor, uh, but it's going to be. And he's going to set up his kingdom. We'll talk more about it in church next Sunday. But let's do this. Don't be discouraged when when somebody can't make people happy. And, and you, you parents, maybe parents or grandparents, trying to compromise to make people happy. You can't make evil happy because evil is a, is a partner with grief and despair and an ugly attitude. You can't make evil happy. And so just stand up for right and love God and love the people of God and love the book of God. And, I mean, let's just enjoy the life God's given us. And uh, there's always been, back in Patrick Henry's day, always been all the way back through history to where the, the disciples were hated uh, all the way back to joseph being sold by his brothers the brother who stood for right was hated by the brothers who stood for wrong it's as simple as that and don't ever fret and let's just enjoy life and enjoy each day and let's keep looking for him because he's coming again and it'll be a great day. I'm excited. I'd love to see him today. Nothing would make me happier than for him to come before you see this video. But whenever he comes, it'll be good. I hope you have a great day and uh, pray. I was going to close with one thing. Um, I started having these morning moments. When COVID happened, everybody was kind of shut down. I did morning and evening back then because I wanted to break up our people's lonely hours. And I wanted to keep us all trusting God. And so morning I did Bible lessons, evening I did history and other different lessons and things, and just trying to be a help to people. Let me encourage you, do something to the people for the people of God. 
how many people watch this? Would you take time to on purpose pray that God would show himself powerful and real and that God would richly bless our church? And, I, and, and if you go to another church, pray that way for your church. But pray for our church too. Uh, I pray for other churches. I pray for other pastors. But we want God to do some great things here. I want, I want so much that God would do great and mighty things among us here. And, and I would ask you, um, you know, don't just pray, God, thank you for the hamburger and the french fries. Stop somewhere once a day, two, three times a day, and say, God, bless our church. God, show yourself mighty. God, do great things. Jeremiah 33, 3 says, you'll do great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Pray. Would you pray for God to show himself very real, very powerful? And again, you can go to other churches. Pray that way for your church. These are days Whatever happens in Washington, whatever happens in, in um, Jerusalem, I want something to happen here for the glory of God. And I want people saved, and I want people growing in grace. And I want, the, I want the money available to send our missionaries to the mission field. I want to help our missionaries. And We need God to do things in our church, in this little corner, this little tiny Wildemar, 34,000 people. And um, we pray, would you do that? Take time to pray a couple times a day. Pray for God to do great things. And what a great privilege we get to serve the King. Have a great day. Thanks for taking a moment. Pray for my voice if you think about it. I'm sure it'll be okay by, by Wednesday night, but it's uh, it's a little rough still from vacation Bible school. My wrists, carpet burns, horsing around with the kids, and I, I've not been wounded. I'm just doing things that old people shouldn't be doing. What a great life God's given us. Have a wonderful day.